let's finish this chapter up by talking about a couple of extensions to the model that, that make it a little bit more realistic. Obviously, we're dealing with a, a world in which there's only one input. We'll generalize that in later chapters. But let's think about what would happen if there are multiple outputs. So let's think about this model where we've got two countries, one factor of production, which we're still going to have as labor, but then we can think about multiple goods. So not just two goods like cheese and wine, but we could have N goods, as many as we wanted. So we'll have now two countries, a home and a foreign. We'll have one input, which is still going to be labor. But we'll think about N goods. N could be three, it could be five, it could be a hundred. Now, clearly we wouldn't do a problem where we have an N that's very big, but there's no reason why we can't make N as big as we need to. Now, what that means is that there's going to be a unit labor requirement for each good. So our unit labor requirements for home will look like this. It'll be the unit labor requirement for good one, which or I'll, let's just call them uh, I. So we'll have unit labor requirements. And I will go from one up to N. So there's going to be a unit labor requirement for each good. So if there were, say, three goods, then there's going to be a unit labor requirement for the first good and a unit labor requirement for the second good and a unit labor requirement for the third good. So that's what that I stands for. It's just an index that tells us which good we're dealing with. There's also going to be foreign unit labor requirements, and their I is going to go from one also up to n. So we're going to think about each good, home and foreign, as being able to produce n goods. There's going to be a unit labor requirement in home for each of those goods and a unit labor requirement in foreign for each of those goods. Now, what we, the way that we're going to work with this particular extension of the model is that we're going to think about the ratio of the unit labor requirements. We can't draw a production possibilities frontier when we have more than two goods. We could think about a production possibilities frontier with three goods, but I'm not good enough to draw you a three-dimensional picture. Um, and of course, once we get to four goods, I certainly can't draw you a picture of that. So, we're not going to be thinking about this situation graphically. We're just going to be thinking about it mathematically. And the easiest way to do that is to think about the ratio of the unit labor requirement for, say, good I, home's unit labor requirement compared or divided by foreign's unit labor requirement for good I. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to order our goods by this number. We're going to think about the unit labor requirement for home divided by the unit labor requirement for foreign, and we're going to order them in order of magnitude. So we'll think about this ordering. It will be the unit labor requirement for good, that should be a one, divided by foreign's unit labor requirement for good one is going to be the smallest one, and then we'll have the second good be such that the ratio of these unit labor requirements is bigger than for good one. And we're going to do that until we get to the unit labor requirement, the largest ratio, and that would be for good n. So it would be the unit labor requirement for good n divided by foreign's unit labor requirement for good n. We're going to simply order the goods such that this ratio ordering holds. Okay? And that may seem weird, but it's actually not that weird. You'll see in the textbook that that's very easy to, uh, to set up that ordering. And I'll, I'll give you an example here in just a, just a bit. So any good for which the unit ratio of these unit labor requirements is going to be less than the relative wage is going to be produced at home. Now let me 
let's let's unpack what that statement means. Let's think about what relative wage tells us about specialization. So the cost of producing one of these goods, say in home, is going to be the wage divided by the unit labor requirement for that good. Okay, so the cost of producing good I is going to look like that. The cost in foreign is going to be their wage divided by their unit labor requirement for that good. So this is the cost in home, this is the cost in foreign. Now this, understanding that, that allows us to create something that helps us solve this problem. So this good I is going to be produced in home if this term is cheaper or lower than that term. So it's produced in home, good I is produced in home if this statement is true, if this is less than that, if the cost of producing it at home, in home is less than the cost of producing it in foreign. Now we can rearrange that a little bit and help us understand something about this ordering. Okay, so if we rearrange this, we can, let's, there's a couple of ways that we can rearrange it. The best way to do it is to, let's do it with a W star on top. So I'm going to rearrange this and I want to leave my W star on top. I'm going to bring this wage down and I'm going to bring this unit labor requirement down and leave that one on top. So let's just do it. Unit labor requirement for good I at home divided by the unit labor requirement for good I in foreign is less than W star over W. Those two statements are equivalent and we can also write it, we could invert these if we wanted. If we wanted to invert them, remember anytime you invert you have to switch the inequality. So we could write it this way the unit labor requirement in foreign divided by the unit labor requirement in home is greater than W over W star. Both of those are equivalent. Okay. It's this one that's actually useful. So what we can see here is that all we have to do is find the place where in this ordering where this relative wage fits. And that tells us, let's say that ordering our relative wage fit right in here. That would tell us that these two goods are going to be produced at home and these goods are going to be produced in foreign. Okay. Or if that relative wage fit in somewhere down here, all the goods to the left of that would be produced at home, all the goods to the right of that would be produced in foreign. So let's do just a quick example and then you'll see that this is actually way easier than what this makes it look like. So let me clear the board. So now we've got some information about five goods. We've got the unit labor requirement for home. This tells us how many hours of labor is used to produce each of the goods. We've got the unit labor requirement in foreign. I've constructed the ratio of the unit labor requirements and ordered the goods such that apples has the smallest ratio of unit labor requirements, enchiladas has the highest. Okay. So now all we have to do is look at this ordering and compare that to our relative wage, W star over W. So let's just pick a relative wage. Um, let's suppose that the relative wage was equal to one-fifth. Okay. What that tells us is that any good that has a ratio of unit labor requirements smaller than one-fifth will be produced at home, and any good that has a ratio of unit labor requirements greater than one-fifth would be produced in foreign. And so one-fifth falls right in there, and so what Given that relative wage, we would see that apples and bananas are produced at home, caviar dates and enchiladas would be produced in foreign. 
if the relative wage were to change, then let's suppose that the relative wage moved down here to where it was one third, then all of a sudden we would have caviar switch from being produced in foreign to being produced at home. So this helps us understand how if we have a good with a model with multiple goods, this helps us understand how to determine which good is produced at home and which good is produced at foreign. The next question, of course, would be how is the relative wage determined? And that's going to be um, determined by the demand and supply of labor. Um, your book talks a little bit about that. I'll let you read that because it's not complicated. But um, this really, if I were to give you a problem, this is uh, what I would want you to be able to work through. The other extension of this model would be to think about what would happen if we have transportation costs. So let's suppose that we had a good on this list with a, a high transportation cost. Intuitively, it should be easy to understand that if we add a high enough transportation cost, we may get a situation where the good is no longer profitable to trade between countries. So for example, if we had a high enough transportation cost for bananas, it may no longer create gains from trade for home to produce bananas and export them to foreign. So we don't really need to work through anything like that. Just keep in mind that, that transportation costs can create a situation where some of the goods are, are just untraded. If co consumers in a country wanted to consume those goods, they would have to be produced in that country. So that's really the end of this chapter. What we'll do now in an upcoming chapter is we'll think about um, what happens when we add multiple inputs. Um, we'll, we'll generalize this basic Ricardian model.